Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your guest host for today, Jason Rosenbaum. Chris McDaniel is on assignment. Joining me in studio is... Joe Manis. And the pride of Monotau County... <laughs> Caleb Jones. Now, I just want to tell our listeners something because this just needs to be emphasized. I called Representative Jones yesterday at 3 p.m. He lives in central Missouri. Not only did he agree to do the show, he actually drove to St. Louis to be here. So he deserves brownie points, gold stars, whatever you possibly could. And he sets the bar. <laughs> well, to be fair, Jason, yes. I am working today in yes. St. Louis. Yes. <laughs> that being There's said, that little... I yes, absolutely. I'm glad to be here. No, this th- is great. Yes, thank you very much for for your time and for coming here. But and we're we're going to be talking a lot about veto session. Veto session will be. On Wednesday. Yes. And we will also be having Representative Joshua Peters, a Democrat, in. We're, we're, we're just flooding the internet with politically speaking podcasts this week. But before we get into the nitty gritty of that, we want to just know a little bit more about who Caleb Jones is. So, first of all, what is your what is the district that you represent? So, I represent the 50th district in the House, in, in the House of Representatives, and it covers four counties, parts of four counties. Montauk County, uh, originally where I'm from, California, Missouri. Cooper County, Cole County, and wow. then also uh, the large, largest portion of my district is Boone County. Yeah, and Cole so. County, for our listeners, is where Jefferson City is. That's correct. Yes. So you're part of the esteemed Boone County delegation. Yeah, and That's Boone County takes in, I, I don't know if your part takes in any, any of Columbia, I do, but, yeah. but it's... It's Columbia. Yeah. For, Part of Columbia. So what's really unique about the 50th was during the redistricting, uh, I, I basically represented Cooper, Monotaw, part of Pettis, and part of Morgan, and that all shifted. Uh, but most importantly with the 50th district, it was actually the district that was taken to court uh, as an example to question the constitutionality of the district. There's been a little bit of talk in recent months about how the House districts have been done, and some have been like, well, the Republicans have an advantage due to, quote, gerrymandering. The truth of the matter is the Republicans had no real role in crafting these districts. They were done by judges at this point. Right, right. But but there initially was a bipartisan panel. There was. Right. Uh, Before it went to the judges. But, 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 but the reason I mention it is you had these very wacky districts, for example, where like California is like drawn right into it. And then it's just part of these other places that have really little to do with what they are, basically. Right. So essentially what they did with the 50th district was they took Chris Kelly's old state rep district, right. which was Southern Boone, Southern Columbia, uh, shortened it a little out of Columbia, crossed the river and circled really my house in California, Missouri, and cut back. <laughs> Literally, the line was 200 yards from my mailbox. Yeah. But while we want to talk a lot about maps and, and geography, w- w- tell me a little bit about yourself. I know that your father, Kenny Jones, was not only a Montauk County Sheriff, but he served in the House for many years. You know, what got you interested in politics? And just tell me a little bit about yourself. And he's the cousin of Speaker Tim Jones. Yes, obviously. You know, uh, I wasn't that political Growing up, I know my dad was sheriff for 20 years in Montauk County. He never really had a race. Uh, the only race that he had was in 1984. And you know, I remember my brother and I standing in the back of a pickup throwing candy out at a parade. That's, <laughs> but you know, What sort of candy? Uh, bubble gum. Okay. I remember we got sick off of eating it. That's <laughs> another long story you don't want to hear. Uh, but politically, you know, a sheriff's race isn't, isn't too political uh, of a race. And... So we weren't really known as the political family or, or political mm-hmm. group of, of Montauk County. And uh, graduated from Montauk, from California High School, uh, went to the University of Missouri and majored in agricultural economics. And uh, I remember I, I went to a Republican club meeting and a Democrat club meeting both uh, just because I wanted to kind of see what was going on. And it frustrated me so much because – the Democrats said, well, the Republicans are doing this, so we have to do this. And then I was like, well, okay, that kind of sounds reactionary. So I went to the Republican club meeting, and they're like, well, the Democrats are doing this, so we have to do this. And none of it really made sense to me. Uh, so I didn't go to any anything politically uh, throughout college and uh, got to got close to graduation. And so I, I figured out I needed a job, and I had a, a professor – uh, tell me I needed to move out to D.C. and Which work. Which professor, by the way? Uh, 
Jan Dave. Okay. okay. I, I, so, I went to Mizzou, too. We may have had some of the same professors, so I was just wondering, but continue. Uh, he, he said, you should go out to D.C. and, and work at, on Capitol Hill. So did you get a political science? I've got an agricultural economics degree. Oh, okay. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. So, but continue. Uh, I did take some political science classes. Okay. So you were in D.C. You worked for former Congressman Kenny Holshoff, and That's you right. also were a, a appointee of, of former President Bush. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I was. Uh, I worked for uh, Congressman Holshoff for a couple of years, came back to MU, started okay. my law degree. Okay. And did that for six months. Okay. And then got approached about being political director for Bush Cheney okay. uh, in Missouri. In 2004, right? In 2004. And where they have you at? Uh, so I was in the St. Louis office. Oh, okay. 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 So, and that was a time when I guess there was a period where Missouri was kind of competitive, and then John Kerry kind of packed up and left, and it was pretty much over. About three weeks out. That's, yeah, a, that's I mean, exactly I can, right. Because I, I remember that. I mean, I remember this very clearly because Terry McAuliffe, who was head of the Democratic Party, had been here because the presidential debate was here that Friday, and there were rumors, and he was saying, no, 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 we're here to stay, yada, yada, yada. And so I had this story that I'd already written separate from the debate story that was supposed to be on the front page of the Post-Dispatch on Sunday, which it was, talking about you know, how they were committed to Missouri and this and that. And then I get a phone call from a trusted Democratic operative Saturday morning that said, you better get to Lambert Field because <laughs> there's a line of them getting on the plane. And so then I called um, a particular the press person, and she wouldn't tell me where she was. Yeah. So then luckily, luckily, and I will say this, Roy Temple, shout out to Roy Temple, who was an operative for Kerry in Minnesota, called me back and said, I'm not going to let her lie to you. She's sitting 10 feet from me. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sure that when that happened, you all were popping champagne and, and – well, patting yourselves on the back. Well, and Bush ended up winning by you over 200,000 votes in the state. It was a blowout. What was really unique about, you know, a lot of times on these presidential uh, campaigns, you'll bring in a lot of people from out of state, people that really aren't vested in the state of Missouri other than to win it and to move on to the next state and the next state. And our executive director uh, our, for victory, on the victory side, on the uh, was a guy named Lloyd Smith. Yeah. Yeah, uh, who I know very well. Yeah, Lloyd. Lloyd's an old political hack. Yeah, he'll probably beat me for <laughs> known, saying that. But I've known Lloyd since uh, when, he was a young political. Hack. One of my one of my dearest friends. He was chief of staff for Congresswoman Joanne Emerson, yes. and then also ran Jim Talent's races, uh, multiple races. Uh, and I remember, it, I remember we were all really happy. It was like October twelfth of the campaign, and, right. and and we felt like we'd won, you know, because they were all rolling out. All the Democrat operatives were leaving the state. We had. Over 70 staffers in the state. We could get anything we want from Bush Cheney. If we needed the president to come to Sedalia, Missouri, right. to the state fair, we did. And he did. I mean, he we had the president of the United States in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Yes. Yeah, I remember that one. I was yes. there. So, was, I, mean, uh, I mean, that stuff, I, I believe that stuff made a difference. I mean, that probably helped Republican turnout, and it may have helped Matt Blunt, Peter Kinder, Sarah Steelman, and all the state legislative candidates. Yeah, because he did a big election eve one in St. Charles. It did, yes. And I was there. So, and, uh, yeah, and that really helped, I mean, because that's a big uh, Republican um, stronghold. block of votes. So, yeah, continue. So, so I was a young political Turk at that point, and one of the my most memorable moments of working on the Bush-Cheney campaign wasn't during all these events. Okay. It was after... Kerry pulled out. Okay. I was sitting in my office. Lloyd Smith's office was two or three doors down, and I could hear him screaming. <laughs> okay. And he's got this laughing. big, southern, yes, he does. boisterous voice. And, I mean, just yelling at this guy. And then all of a sudden, I hear him slam down the phone, and I, I went in there. I said, Lloyd, what's going on? And what happened was, was Bush Cheney and uh, the RNC were pulling all their staff out of the state of Missouri— and Lloyd, be, because Kerry, had be, because out. Kerry had pulled out, yes. so we were doing the same thing. So Lloyd was fighting to keep as many staffers mm -hmm. here in the state for the next three weeks because he knew the how much it would affect the outcome of people like Matt Blunt, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So and was he successful or no? Well, uh, we they kept, kept some. We, yeah, did. we kept. Uh, we probably kept sixty, seventy percent of our staff, which was really unique for a state yeah. that gets. That yeah, because McCaskill claims that that yeah, made a difference. Yeah, but let's flash forward a little bit. So it's 2010. You got your law degree from Mizzou. Your dad is actually running for state senate yeah. um, in a Jefferson City-based district. And you, I guess, make the decision to run to replace him. Why did you end up doing that? 
you know, uh, working on it, I'd, I'd worked on numerous campaigns at that point, and uh, I saw how much of a difference my dad made as state rep. I knew that he liked it. And, you know, I had some people from the community come to me and say, hey, Caleb, would you at least consider this? And, mm-hmm. and truthfully, I hadn't, I hadn't considered being the guy on the bumper sticker or on the 4 by 8 sign at all. Uh, and I had a lot of fun being a political operative, working on campaigns. Also, my law, my law firm was really just starting to grow and become uh-huh. become really profitable. And uh, I, you know, I, I spent a little time thinking about it, and I just thought, you know, opportunity to become to to public surface finds you. You don't find it, yeah. and a lot of times people That's don't true. realize that. So I signed up. Uh, ran had a had a primary that I won uh, pretty substantially, and then had a Constitution Party candidate. Yeah, um, and you have really never faced a, a serious election since, and I wouldn't even say your first one was that serious, given how much you won. Is that true? Uh, I worked very hard on it. Yeah, uh, I was involved in a lot of other races during that time as well. You know, I spent a lot of time on my dad's race. Yes, uh, and a lot of times people running for state rep. They don't have a background in politics. Yes, right. They don't have. They don't. They don't. They don't know who. You know, whenever Jason Rosenbaum or Joe Manis mm-hmm. calls them, they don't know who that. They're like, well, who is that? Yeah. And I had the luxury of knowing uh, a lot of people involved uh, in pl- politics, not only from a consultant and newspaper standpoint, but also from a fundraising standpoint. Who are who are substantial donors? Who are people who will find you volunteers to work on campaigns and i think it helped me a lot uh, in my first race it's helped me a lot obviously on other races i've worked on and and helped and it's i think it's helped me be successful politically Mm -hmm. uh, as state representative now let's let's what's kind of your role in the house because i guess you're going to be entering your third term you're you're unopposed this this cycle i just want to mention that you, I think you're a chairman of the General Laws Committee. That's correct. Um, and w- what what's kind of your role in the House now and kind of what you see your role in the future? Because obviously with term limits, there are, there are people that are going to be leaving. There are people who are running for other offices. Your cousin, Speaker Tim Jones, is leaving, will be replaced by, by Speaker Deal. Um, what, what do you see your, your role in the House, basically? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to do everything I can to help the House. Uh, get our priorities passed and be successful for the next four years while I'm in office and whatever role I have, that's kind of, that will be my focus. Uh, the general laws committee is really known as the speaker's committee. Uh-huh, right. You know, a lot of bills, it can, it can hear any bill on any topic really at any time. And a lot of controversial bills will go there. A lot of Senate bills that come over after the Senate passes them, they'll go to general laws. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I plan on being chair of general laws for at least another couple of years, uh, making sure that we get good legislation passed and, and help the state. Yeah. And w- do you ever have any designs on the Senate down the road? You know, uh, the the Senate seat that I'm in is Kurt Schaefer's. Right, and he's going to be leaving. He is, and it's Boone County and Cooper County. And I've represented Cooper County before, a mm-hmm. uh, state rep before redistricting. So it uh, it lays out pretty nice. A 2016 run, which me- means I would have two more years in the House if I didn't run for Senate. Uh, I haven't really made a formal decision mm-hmm. on that. You know, I, I answer to uh, two speakers <laughs> of the House. One of them is my wife, yeah. the, speaker, <laughs> the speaker of my house. And, and I've got a one-year-old uh, boy named Max, and, and really it's going to be a decision that, that my whole family makes it, with me. Yeah, that'll be a big decision because I would say that you are probably the, the top Republican possibility for that seat and yes. the top Democrat for that seat, Stephen Weber. I know that you're pretty good friends with him. I think he's going to be a very strong candidate to take that seat back. But if it is Weber versus Jones, it might be the friendliest Senate race we've seen in a while. So we'll, we'll well, at least in the beginning. We'll we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Till the knives get sharp. Well, Til the yeah, knives. I mean, because hey, politics is politics. Yeah. You know, it's not personal. But I, I but I've known both of you guys for a long time, especially Representative Weber, and I'm impressed with both of them. So I hope may the best man win if that happens. So on to the veto <laughs> session, which officially begins on Wednesday morning, uh, September 10th. Uh, there's been projections that it may continue through at least. Uh, Thursday and possibly part of Friday. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about it? What what uh, you see as some of the um, I've talked to uh, Speaker Jones 
but uh, just kind of what your thoughts are of what, as a rank and file member and as a chairman of general laws, what sort of things you think will probably be the most likely to try for veto attempts? Well, I think veto override. Uh, a lot of the bills that were passed this year were Senate bills. Right. So I don't want to, I don't want to give them everything, but the, literally the ball is in the Senate's yeah, court on a, a lot of Yeah, 22 is a 33, that, apparently. That's a, exactly right. So, you know, the House can't do anything on any bill that is a Senate bill. So a lot of what we're going to have to do is wait and see what the Senate passes. Uh, issues like the, the school transfer bill, mm-hmm. the gun bill, um, all those issues are in the Senate. They aren't over on, on our side. Um, some of the House bills I think that we'll, we will probably discuss and, and I think we'll vote on are um, the, all the pro-life yeah, bills. Yeah, the 72-hour bill. The 72-hour the, the bill, yes. hour bill, the uh, tax credits for pregnancy resource centers, Kevin yes. Engler's bill. Yes. Uh, House Bill 1326 is uh, – it's been – I mean, it has really gotten heated just in the last two or three weeks. That's an ag bill, uh, but it also deals with – Captive servants. I was going to say captive deer. Captive yeah. deer. So the yeah. captive deer debate. That seems has, like that's a huge issue in the rural parts of the state. It, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. The, it that, is. Do you, Do you want to explain that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so currently, uh, the if you have a deer breeding operation, whether you're you're growing deer to you know sell their mounts or for any reason. You are basically following protocols set forth by the Department of Conservation. And so the Department of Conservation sets all the rules and regulations for you as a as a deer breeder. And in the last two or three years, they have started changing some of the regulations, uh, making it very tough for somebody to grow deer here in the state of Missouri to raise deer. Because the whole thing is, don't they fence them in and then they and then they allow hunters to come in? Is that right? Uh, so. Some allow hunters to come in for controlled hunts. Some some of them actually just take uh, the antlers, or uh, even the and they you can take antlers in velvet too. There's also high demand for the the actual antlers and over there in velvet. Yeah, but is, you have to kill the deer to do it. Correct? No, you don't. You don't. Okay, no. go ahead. That's good to know. Deer, deer shed their antlers every year. Right, that's so. correct. It's just like crab legs in, yeah. in Florida. You can you can snap off a crab leg and let them go and they'll regenerate. But okay. continue. Yeah. Uh, so what's happened is is the Department of Conservation has basically frozen any deer coming in and out of the state of Missouri. Is this part of because of the wasting disease? They're they're claiming it's because of this wasting disease. There there are obviously scientists on both sides of the issue that say this isn't affecting anything, uh-huh. and that there have only been three instances in the state of Missouri, uh, and it was all at one farm. Um, but regardless, they've they've basically closed the borders of Missouri mm-hmm. for deer okay. coming in or deer coming out, and then they've also set out rules that require double fencing. And what that means is you have to have a ten foot tall fence, I believe ten foot tall, and then a gap, and then another fence uh, to keep basically to keep a, a buffer around all of these captive deer. And I and I don't know if you guys have ever put up fence. I've put up enough yes. that I. Now we'll never do it again. Hopefully, I mean, you know. Well, thankfully, but, my house came with a fence. But continue. So putting up a double fence around a say a thousand acre farm mm-hmm. uh, is very costly and and really is impossible to do almost as a if you're trying to actually run a business. So the bill, if I recall, removes the Department of Conservation so, as the overseer. Absolutely, and and so none of these regulations are dealt with in the law in the in the bill out there. But what is dealt with in the bill is it takes the regulation of deer breeders and and basically captive servants is what it's called they're called uh, and moves it from the Department of Conservation to the Department of Agriculture. Yeah. Right, and that that's a big deal because the Department of Agriculture is a department where the governor appoints the the director and it has appropriation authority by the legislature. The conservation department is essentially its own universe that gets a direct funding source through a That's sales tax. It, it's run by a commission that is, you know, appointed by the governor, but pretty much doesn't have to listen to them. It's a big. I think that's a pretty big deal, wouldn't you say? It it absolutely is. I mean, it's big enough that 
has really caused all this uh, discussion. And you know, people that are heavily involved with the Department of Conservation uh, are saying that we need to keep these regulations here within the Department of Conservation. Uh, and the people that the deer breeders are actually going out and saying, look, this is an issue that they're treated like cattle. They're ear tagged. They're monitored. For, you know, they're vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Why, why aren't they in the Department of Ag? And uh, captive elk in the state of Missouri are monitored through the Department of Ag. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be one bill. But you mentioned the, the, the quote unquote pro-life and gun bills. So the, the two, those, what you're talking about is extending the waiting period 70, the 72 to 72 hour, hours right. for an abortion. And also this, it's kind of a multifaceted gun bill that would lower the conceal and carry age and also set up a process that would potentially allow some school districts to have armed teachers, school resource, yeah. Yes. School resource officers. Now, my assumption is those bills may have a decent chance of being overridden because probably most Republicans, if not all Republicans, will vote for it. And you'll get some conservative Democrats or maybe a couple of conservative Democrats who are running for state Senate who uh, might vote although for Although the 72-hour bill is still more complicated because it doesn't have an exception for that's correct. Rape or incest. And there's only there's no room for error in the Senate because there's only 23 members, and it's unlikely any Democrats will vote yeah, for and, that. Yeah, and when the Senate approved it the first time, they did not have an override total. So so, so what's kind of your take on where those right. bills go? Uh, well, the gun bill uh, is a Senate bill. Right. It's Will Krause's uh, bill. Correct. So, you know, I think that there have been some issues since session has gotten out to veto session that that really haven't been brought up before, and and what I'm really talking about is Ferguson. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there have been multiple elected officials that have said they're going to talk about Ferguson in the Capitol during veto session, that they want to start the discussion on uh, the issues dealing with Ferguson, what caused it, uh, and so I that think that's that good. might affect the I, gun bill. Well, I think that it's going to affect any bill that goes through the legislature. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that was going to be my next question. Uh, we'll backtrack a little from that other one. You know, the governor has come under a lot of criticism for his handling of Ferguson. And not only has he gotten criticized by his own party, and I imagine the people you're talking about are going to be Democrats, but in this time when he usually would be barnstorming the state talking about how bad the Missouri legislature is, he's been dealing with this Ferguson situation. That's correct. So do you think that those two things are going to have an impact on how veto session goes. I think it. I think it will uh, greatly impact what happens at veto session. I think that the discussion of Ferguson, uh, the discussion of the governor, uh, are are both going to be brought up during veto session. I think that they're going to. It's going to be a real discussion, um, asking questions, trying to find answers, and I think it's going to set the trend for where we go in January whenever we go back into into session. So how? I mean, so would it? Slow down some votes? I mean, tactically, during veto session. Uh, I mean, I know I've talked to some Democrats who are upset with the governor, but then on the other hand, they're they're not supportive of some of these bills separate from him. So they say, well, we're not going to over try to vote override X because we do agree with his veto. Right, on. right. So how do you, I mean, how do you see this playing out? Well, what's, what's really unique about the Senate okay. is that they have the ability to filibuster. Okay. Okay. So uh, on the House side, we're limited to 15 minutes per person. Right. And uh, we don't have that ability. But I think that there is a, the opportunity is ripe for somebody to get involved in a Senate bill that they don't like and start a filibuster process very easily. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the issue of Ferguson is one that can garner a lot of time and discussion and so should they could use t- that during the during the gun bill debate yeah. absolutely but, uh, okay. i think that they can use it during the gun i think that they they will use it during the gun bill debate i think they'll use it during the educational uh school okay. transfer bill okay. yeah. that's coming up uh that passed out of the senate that uh narrowly passed out of the house mm-hmm. But could it work the other way, though? I know that some of the, the African-American Democrats are really mad at Nixon over some of those issues. So maybe they, you know, make a fiery speech and then are like, let's pass this school transfer bill or let's pass this bill to show the governor, you know, you d- weren't there for us. Is that a possibility as well? Uh, well, it's politics. Anything's possible, Jason. I think that that opportunity to the uh, the anger or resentment towards Nixon 
will actually really come out in the budget process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's what I think. Yeah. Cut, yeah. I, so, so the governor has the ability to line item veto anything out of the budget, mm-hmm. and he also has the ability to withhold funds. Yes, he does. So, um, and that's and you know, and three quarter. He's he's. He's taken over a billion out of the budget. Three quarters of it is stuff that he's withheld. That's yeah. correct. But there's a bunch of line item vetoes, and I've read elsewhere that there's discussion of overriding all of his line item vetoes. The question is whether they have to do it as a batch or whether they do it one by one. They do it one by one. It's it's basically impossible. So there's a hundred. I believe there's a hundred or yes. hundred and sixty one yes. line item vetoes. Yes, there are. Yeah. You know, if and we were discussing this yesterday, if if we took ten minutes per. Uh, line item that's 1600 minutes that's 30 hours and from what i understand there are legal questions about whether or not you can do them as a batch yeah that's but i want to ask a more practical question about that let's say you you overrode all of them couldn't the governor just withhold all the money that's anyways? exactly right so it's really kind of a more of a statement exercise than an actual thing unless he changes his mind right well and yes the governor can just withhold anything that we override uh out of the budget uh, I think it's going to be really tough for him if revenue numbers pick up uh, the way that they're I, – I think they're looking. And uh, it's going to be tough for him to explain why he's withholding money from you know, schools, from uh, low-income uh, individuals trying to get college credit. There's a, you know, the, the veto list that, that he vetoed was really um, – I think it surprised everybody the yeah. amount of light items he vetoed out and he didn't. He didn't just withheld withhold the money. He vetoed it. Now, now some of it though is appears to be contingent on what the uh, general assembly does with those ten bills, those various tax breaks that he derisively calls the Friday favors. Yes, well, yes, and he claims that that is part of the that that makes up roughly about three hundred million or so. Of so, the, if that's the case, okay. why did he veto it, not just withhold it? Yeah, that's right, what, right, that's, right, and right. that's sure, the argument sure. that. That everybody should have is, you know, if he's claiming that tax cut bills were uh, causing him to veto all of this stuff, why don't you just withhold the money and wait and see, since he vetoed all these tax cut bills, wait and see if we override them and then either release the money or keep withholding it. Yeah. But again, it's kind of we'll have to see what happens there. But it, it might be a situation where you override something that's really important and he may change course. He may just decide to withhold it anyways, and it's kind of a mood exercise. Yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, just so our listeners understand, uh, in Missouri, they have to end the fiscal year with a balanced budget, and it's up to the governor, whoever it is, to make sure that it ends up balanced. So that's why you have some money that's vetoed, but then some that are, quote, withheld that may be restored later if it looks like money is coming in enough to let it go. Now, this is just education. Now, now the school, you mentioned the school transfer bill, and it passed by an overwhelming margin in the Senate but a very slim margin in the House. And it's kind of been assumed that because there were a lot of Republicans that voted against that and not enough Democrats voting for it, that that bill may not even be brought up. What's kind of your sense on what could happen there? Because if it does get brought up and overridden, that's probably the biggest thing that it could probably override at this point. What's kind of the status of that from what you've heard? Well, once again, it's a Senate bill. So we're dealing with that. We, we got to see what the Senate does. I, uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if they override it. I mean, they it got voted out of the Senate with an 20, overwhelming 27 number. 20, or 28 yeah. votes, yeah. yeah. So I think that uh, from a political standpoint, I think that that I see the Senate overriding it and putting it on on the steps of the House and and saying, look, you know, we're trying to we're trying to fix these school transfer issues. It's up to the House to step up and get that done. And I think that I think it's gonna. I think that it will spur some discussion on the House side to really try to get something done, especially now that we've seen some some folks commenting in the newspapers that they don't feel that the governor stepped up and done his job to to try to fix this as well. Yeah. So even if it may not get overridden, it may be a jumping off point for next year, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah, essentially. I mean, overall, though, I mean. I guess Nixon vetoed about 32 or 33 bills. 33 bills. 33. Uh, one of them was already overridden this year, the tax cut bill, if I'm not mistaken. And last year, you overrid two, 10 bills, which I think was a record. Your, your cousin, Speaker Jones, told me a couple of weeks ago that they're expecting another, quote, historic veto session. Now— He was a bit more cautious when I talked to he's him He's a bit yesterday. more cautious. Now, I mean, 
in in some ways, like the quantity of bills is not really the measuring stick. Because let's if, if that was the measuring stick, you could override ten bills naming the state dog and declare victory. Though, well, I think you could argue you yeah. could override. 10 budget yeah, line exactly. items. It, exactly. It's really the type of bills. But like what do, do you think that there's going to be, you know, a large quantity of bills and a large quantity of important bills or is it just going to really depend on, you know, what the Senate does and what the margins were when they were voted on in the first place? I think that the discussion on the House side is going to be very budget based. Mm-hmm. Um you know, the, a couple of the bills I named before, the, the really the pro-life legislation, I think, that will pass that. Mm-hmm. I right. think, I think the, the real discussion on the House side is going to be the budget, and it's going to be how do we go through these 160 line-item vetoes and, and either vote them up or vote them down. And uh, I think the discussion on the Senate side is going to be much different than that, obviously, because they don't have the budget bills to start with. But they're going to really go through the legislation, the 22 vetoes that they have, and figure out what bills can they pass. Yeah. Now, just looking a little bit ahead, you mentioned that uh, I think the Senate may be talking a lot about Ferguson. And I think that the Ferguson situation is a local thing, but I think it will warrant some sort of state legislative response when the legislature comes back. That's my assumption. I don't know if that, yeah, that's the January, case yes. for you. But w- what do you think the legislature could do to kind of handle that situation, well, whether it be education, whether it be police? What do you think will happen? First, Jason, I don't think it's a local issue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I you know, it, there was there was discussions and debates throughout the entire country uh, involving this. There was an article in the Washington Post today dealing – uh, talking about the various municipalities uh, within St. Louis County versus uh, shock <laughs> <laughs> ver- versus hot news or uh, municipalities. County. That's yeah, exactly <laughs> what what this uh, what I feel this uh, Ferguson discussion has brought up is uh, a variety. I think it, it de- we're going to have an education uh, issues being brought up dealing with this. I think we'll we'll have some law enforcement issues that will be discussed uh, in depth, but. I think that we'll also bring up the various municipalities we have throughout the entire county and uh, how other counties as large as St. Louis, do they have that many? And The answer is no, by the way. I, right. They, they don't. I mean, St. Louis County is, is an entity of itself nationally. But, you know, with, with the state laws being as they are, yeah. there's no real way you can just— yeah, let me just not to yeah. get too in the weeds right. here, but according to the state statutory regulations, there is no process to dissolve a municipality that is above a fourth class city. And many of the cities in St. Louis County are above that. So you would a have to maybe change that law in case you want to have some of them become unincorporated. You may have to pass a law to see if they can merge with each other, although I'm pretty sure there is already a state law. And and just the bigger issue is I don't know if you can have a top-down approach where you force some of these municipalities to do anything. It may have to come from the local entities. It, it does. I mean, listen, before you guys, you know, when you were infants or not alive, back in the 80s, there was this big effort led by Gene McNary, who's then the Republican county executive in St. Louis County. They had this whole, we, we had commission meetings. There was all this stuff. They crafted these maps. They were going to convert uh, St. Louis counties, all the municipalities into at, at one point, roughly a dozen municipalities. None of that happened. So because it, the local people didn't want it. Yeah, but it, it, there is a state legislative role, as I mentioned, because you may have to change the regulations to maybe make it easier for mergers or yeah. But if they don't want to do it, but if they don't want to do it, that's up to them, basically. So. Well, and the, I think the other question that really comes into play is, do we want a, uh, a taxing subdivision that makes forty percent of their revenue off of fines and court costs yeah yeah off of yeah yeah from from yeah yeah speed, I mean, yeah, speed speed traps they keep their lights on by writing tickets yeah but i mean that's right I, I mean there have been efforts to maybe curb at least red light cameras if not you know those type of things but i guess the big obstacle is always the municipal league and cities that want to have that option is that correct Basically. Well, they use speed cameras. But yeah. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, speed cameras are still around. Uh, yeah, the the municipal league um, represents all the all the cities and towns in the state of Missouri, and a lot of their towns and cities' revenue comes from fines and court costs yes. dealing with citations, whether it's yards being not being mowed or speeding tickets or seatbelt tickets or any of those. They uh, derive a lot of their funding 
from citations and up to 40 percent, I believe. Yeah, and what the Washington Post article that you alluded to mentioned is a lot of the people who are ensnared in the system are, are poor. They don't have the resources to pay some of these tickets. And when they don't, they there's bench warrants put on them. There's other fines. And they're basically put into this financial hell, basically. So would that be something the legislature would try to address? Or could that be something that maybe the courts the Supreme Court tries to address internally or something like well, that. Well, uh, I think that it's something the legislature is going to address. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the, 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 any, any law change would have to be with the yeah. legislature. And, you know, and whenever a, uh, any court only has court every two weeks, somebody gets picked up on a bench warrant for a failure to pay a speeding ticket or failure to pay a, a parking ticket, you get picked up on a bench warrant, you're in jail for two weeks waiting to yes. get in front of a judge to get back out, uh, I think that's a problem. Well, because yeah. you could lose your job if that's, you're some, you, yeah. you know. You could lose your job, but more importantly, if you have a, I have a wife and a, a one-year-old child, if somebody takes me away for two weeks, that's an issue. Well, you you kind of mentioned law enforcement, too. I know that you come from a law enforcement background, and there's been a lot of criticism of how, you know, the St. Louis County Police has, has operated. But there's also been kind of a pushback that maybe the criticism of the police has maybe gone a little too far. I'd be interested in getting your perspective on what changes might come to law enforcement and what's your perception of how the police have acted in this situation. Well, I think uh, the changes that, that will be brought up are really not dealing with how law enforcement acts, but really the relationships that law enforcement have with other law enforcement officials, mm -hmm. um, working county officers, working with municipal officers or, you know, or state officers for that matter. I think that that'll be a discussion brought up. I, I think that uh, trying to figure out what the relationship is with each other and, and who really makes the decisions uh, in a situation like Ferguson uh, should be discussed. And we should have some kind of protocol set up in place so that we know who is in charge, and who's making the decisions. Yeah, because, well, in St. Louis County, the St. Louis County Police does not have jurisdiction over these local police departments no. unless the local municipality asks the county police to come in. That's yes. correct. And, and I think it's something that people don't they, quite, always understand. They, they're, I can't tell you how many people assume that when they saw those images of the police officers with high-end equipment, they thought that was the Ferguson Police Department, when in actuality, most likely it was... St. Louis County Police Department, maybe the Highway Patrol. The St. Louis County Police Department is the third biggest police department in the state. It makes sense they would have that type of equipment, but you know that may be more of a federal issue since a lot of that's coming in Can't, from there. Might the legislature get involved in the whole debate about police wearing cameras as far as allocations or that sort of thing? Uh, I think I think it's a very valid discussion. You know, uh, city officers in Columbia, Missouri, have started wearing cameras, and it's. I think that it's. It's helped make the officers better officers, and it's helped the public make be better public because everybody knows whenever you're on camera uh, that your acts are being documented. So I think that it's a good discussion. You know, in California, Missouri, I don't think they're going to be able to afford to put cameras on every every city officer. Yeah. So it's a funding issue. It's not a. It's not that they don't want that. It's a funding issue. I think it's something we need to address. Yeah. And okay. we'll, we'll see what happens. Anyways, we're going to wrap the show up right now. Um, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, Glad by to the be way. Great. Um, we can read all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Joe at Jay Manis. That's J M A N N I E S. And you can find delightful pictures of Representative Jones's son at Caleb M. Jones. Yeah, and other things as well. We'll be back next week. Until then, so long. So long. Bye.